The Islamic Revolution in Iran began with lofty promises of freedom and equality. Leftist allies stood alongside Islamist leaders, anticipating a shared vision for a liberated Iran. But as history would reveal, once power was secured, these idealistic allies became among the revolution's first casualties. History has a way of repeating itself, and the lessons from Iran's revolution might be the cautionary tale we need now. Today, in a world where leftist groups rally behind Islamist factions like Hamas, it's worth asking, have these activists learned anything from history? So if you want to discover how the story of Iran's Islamic revolution holds the warning for us today, especially for those who champion groups like Hamas, stay put, as it's coming up. While exiled in France, Khomeini, the face of the revolution, promised an Islamic democracy that would serve the people's will. Many believed him, thinking they'd get a say in the new Iran. Initially, a major spectrum of political activists declared their strong support for the leadership of Khomeini. Most revolutionaries back then believed that after the success of their efforts, Khomeini would just walk away from politics to resume his teachings at a religious institution. Fast forward to the revolution's success, the story takes a darker turn. Once in power, Khomeini's tune changed the utopian leftists, democrats, and liberals who had dreamed of a democratic Iran gradually found themselves sidelined. Khomeini's government, now in power, began to implement strict Islamic laws, including the mandatory hijab for women, a rule that some leftists initially did not oppose, seeing it as a symbol of resistance against westernization. The government, though, was on its way to become more and more strictly Islamic constitutionally based on the supreme leadership of a mullah. The hijab law was just the beginning. The regime imposed a ban on women singing in public, outlawed alcohol, and prohibited dance and music, which had been integral parts of Iranian culture. These measures were part of a broader agenda to reshape society along strictly Islamic lines drawn directly or implicitly from Quranic injunctions and the practices attributed to the so-called Prophet Muhammad. The new legal system introduced harsh punishments that seemed to belong to a bygone era. Public whippings, imputations, and even executions became state-sanctioned penalties for what many considered to be minor daily life activities, such as consuming alcohol or attending parties. Khomeini, in his speeches, defend these practices, citing Quranic verses as justification, particularly in the case of theft, where he upheld the punishment of cutting hands as a divinely sanctioned deterrent. This hardline approach led to growing discontent among various groups, including journalists and writers who began to voice their opposition to the sudden shift in Khomeini's stance and the increasingly oppressive policies of his government. In response, Khomeini metaphorically called upon his followers to shatter their pants, a call that symbolized the crushing of dissent and the silencing of critical voices. Journalists who challenged the regime's narrative faced intimidation, censorship, and in many cases, imprisonment or wars. This period marked a significant shift from the pre-revolutionary promises of freedom and democracy to a regime that did not tolerate opposition. 
their hopes for a society where diverse opinions would flourish were quickly overshadowed by the reality of an Islamic regime that broke no challenge to its authority. The suppression of free speech and the curtailment of personal freedoms became defining features of the post-revolutionary state, leaving many to reflect on the true cost of the uprisings and the complex legacy it left behind. Imad al-Din Baghi, a prominent Iranian journalist and human rights advocate who actively participated in the revolution, has reported that over 10,000 individuals have been executed in Iran since the establishment of the Islamic Republic. This dreadful tally includes political prisoners from various backgrounds, notably leftists. The darkest chapter of this period is the mass executions of 1988, where estimates suggest that between 2,800 and 5,000 political prisoners were put to death nationwide, buried en masse in unmarked graves scattered across anonymous fields, all that without due legal proceedings. While these figures extend only up to the year 2009, and notably they do not encompass the more recent events such as the tragic death of Massa Amini and the subsequent crackdowns and executions. The Shah's regime, while also responsible for political executions, did not reach the scale of what was witnessed after the revolution, acknowledged Baghi. Khomeini even started to define enemies for his brainless followers and basically the Islamic nation, shaping Iran's domestic and foreign policies. His call to reject liberal candidates and the execution of leftists for religious dissent set a tone of intolerance. On the international stage, his branding of the United States as the Great Satan and Israel as a cancerous tumor escalated tensions leading to severe economic sanctions. The nation's military expenditure soared, contributing to a broken economy. Recent data indicates that the poverty rate in Iran was roughly 22% in 2022. That's more than one person out of every five. In one of his speeches, Khomeini recounted the story of Banu Ghoreza, a Jewish tribe from the time of Muhammad. مولای ما امیر المومنین اون مرد نمونه عالم و در رحم و مروت اون طور با مستکبرین و با کسانی که توتر می کنن شمشیر را می کشت و هفتت نفر را در یک روز از یهود منی می که نزیه شاید بود و اینها از نسل اونها شاید باشند از دم شمشیر گذران after the Battle of the Trench, the Banu Qurayza were accused of betraying their pact with the Muslim community of Medina. The judgment passed was severe. All pubescent males were considered combatants and were executed, while the women and children were taken into captivity. Khomeini, in his speech, referred to this event with approval, noting that Ali bin Abi Talib gloriously beheaded 600 to 900 men of the Banu Qurayza under Muhammad's supervision. This practice of Muhammad in dealing with the Jewish tribe was used by Khomeini to draw a parallel to contemporary times, suggesting that the descendants of those Jewish tribesmen were now in Israel and implying Israelis deserved a similar fate. But Khomeini is not the only Islamist who would like to devoutly follow Muhammad's practice. Hamas has expressed strong opposition to Israel's existence too. Their charter, written in 1988, calls for the destruction of Israel and opposes any peaceful resolution to the conflict. According to their ideology, the entire land of Palestine stretching from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea is an inseparable Islamic territory consecrated for future Muslim generations until Judgment Day. It's exactly because of all these facts that many liberal Iranians, those whose brains were not washed by Islamic propaganda, consistently support Israel in demonstrations during the Israel-Hamas conflict. And because, unlike you guys, they know that Islam always start cute and friendly like this. But once its followers get the upper hand, it ends up like this.
or this or this having lived under an Islamic regime over 40 years they even go as far as inviting Israel to target military bases within their own country as seen through slogans written on walls After the death of Khomeini, Iran's next supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, not only upheld Khomeini's vision but took it further into an era of intensified repression and violence justified under the banner of Islamic law. In his sermon on April 14, 2000, Khamenei openly discussed violence as a valid approach drawing from Muhammad's practices after the conquest of Mecca. <laughs> در مقابل اقتشاشگری در مقابل تعدی از قانون قرار میگیرد حکومت اسلامی بایستی با قدرت با قاطعیت با خشونت از اسم خشونت که نباید ترسیم رفتار بکند پیغمبر اکرم وارد مکه شد عده ای را به نام ذکر کرد گفت هر کجا اینها را یافتید هر کس دست بر اینها پیدا کرد اینها را بکشد توشون چهار تا زن بود و عده ای مرد امام رضوان الله علیه گفت هر کس سلمان رشدی را پیدا کرد او را بکشد امروز هم رهبری اگر بر طبق احکام اسلام یک جا تکلیفش اقتضاب کنه علنی خواهد بود If you're interested in the real details of the bloody conquest of Mecca, be sure to watch our dedicated clip. Here Khamenei leaned on Islamic historical precedents to legitimize the state's authority to silence, punish, and execute those deemed threats to the Islamic order, echoing a message that the violence against dissenters isn't just permissible but divinely endorsed. This narrative around legitimate violence finds jurisdiction in Muhammad's own tradition, especially his actions against those he saw as opponents or apostates. This tradition, combined with Quranic commandments, continues to inform many Islamic clerics who justify the execution of individuals choosing to leave Islam. You may want to hear the shocking speech of Khomeini's son about the order of killing Salman Rushdie. His speech was done in presence of secret agents and IRGC officers. شما می دونید اگر سلمان رشدی رو بکشید از 100 سال کار فرهنگی اثرش بیشتر هست. وزارت اطلاعات باید به امام جواب بده. سپاه پاسداران انقلاب اسلامی شما پاسدار انقلاب اسلامی هستید به پیغمبرتون حمله شده. نشستید اینجا که بهتون اجازه بدم برید خارج یا نه؟ برید کتاب فرعارف منفجر کنید شما وقتی میگفتن که ما چند نفر میخواییم رو مین بره شهید میخواییم بشن شما یه مرتبه همه با هم میمدید جلو خب شما را بیفتید کتاب خونه ها را آتیش بزنید سفارت خونه ها را آتیش بزنید خودتون هم ممکنه سطمه میمینید مگه در جنگ خودتون سطمه نمیدیرید حالا شما 300-400 نفر شهید بشید ببینید میتونید این رو بکشید میتونید اون کار رو هم بزنید یا نه شما اگر بخواید انقلابتون در دنیا به عنوان مرکز سقل تمامی ایمانه های دنیا باشه مرکز سقل تمامی انقلاب های دنیا باشه باید این رو بکشید Now let's take a look at the next excerpt from the official website of Iran's supreme leader which clearly states that Muhammad primarily ordered executions for those involved in what he termed as the soft war against Islam. A soft war is when you use non-violent methods like online campaigns, media outlets, propaganda, peaceful protests, and legal actions to spread your ideas and influence people. It's a war of words and not weapons. It's a battle of ideas not soldiers. But according to this website and other Islamic factions like the Taliban and Muslim Brotherhood, anyone who does this against Islam deserves to die. Interestingly, while Muslims advocate for the promotion of their ideology worldwide, they often exhibit intolerance towards dissenting views, especially when it challenges their religious principles. This selective approach to freedom of expression 
reveals a concerning trend of theological bigotry and fanaticism. In practical terms, this twisted and biased perspective on freedom of expression poses a threat to human rights, particularly in regions where Islam holds significant influence. If left unchecked, the unchecked hegemony of Islam could undermine the human rights principles cherished by many nations, leading to dire consequences for civil liberties. We can't let that happen. We have to stand up for our fundamental rights and protect them from being gradually taken away. Let's wake up to these realities and strive for a future where freedom of expression is universally respected, regardless of religious or ideological differences. در پی ضربه زدن به اسلام بودن افراد فرشته دارم قافلگیرانو کشتن به عنوان نمونه یک زن خبیسی بود به نام اسماء بنت مروان شاعر بود شاعرم میدونید اون موقع بزرگترین رسانه بود در علیه اسلام اشعار ناجوری می سرود فوری هم پخش می شد امنیت روانی مسلمان ها رو به خطر انداخته بود حضرت ارز کنم امیر ابن عدی معمور کرد نفوذ کنه داخل ارز کنم قبیله اینها از یک فرصت استفاده کنه قافلگیر کنه این زن رو بکش و کشته کسی که رسانه این شده علیه اسلام او رو از بین برده یا یک یهودی بود پیرمردی هم بود ابو افک او هم شاعر بود علیه اسلام شعر می سرو We covered these acts of violence by Muhammad in this series the origins of Islamic terrorism. Today, as leftists and some anti-war activists in Western nations rally behind Hamas, there is a critical question we must ask. Have we learned from history? As Iranians can't help but notice the parallels in a sense that's similar to leftist revolutionaries in Iran who once cheered Khomeini's promises, today's activists as well seem blind to the dangers of supporting an Islamic movement with a similarly authoritarian agenda. If they don't seem vicious enough to some already, it's just because they have not acquired the whole real political and military power over the region. Similar to Islamic Republic in Iran, in Gaza, Hamas reign since 2007 has mirrored Iran's strict Islamist policies. While protesters in the West might idealize Hamas as a voice against oppression, the reality within Gaza tells a different story. Hamas has taken extreme measures to silence opposition and enforce Islamic orthodoxy in Gaza often targeting journalists and activists who dissent. In 2019 alone, over a thousand demonstrators were detained for protesting economic conditions, facing physical abuse and threats for voicing their discontent, as Human Rights Watch documented. Criticism of the leadership or policies, particularly from leftist or secular groups, has led to detention, torture, and harassment, tactics that Western leftists should recognize as antithetical to the values they profess. Western supporters of Hamas should understand that this isn't a fight for freedom as they imagine it. Furthermore, Hamas has imposed Islamic restrictions. Under Hamas, public morality laws restrict behavior in the name of Islamic values dress codes, restrictions on public behavior, and bans on anything considered an Islamic. These have become the norm, just as they did in post-revolutionary Iran. Are you tired of the divisions fueled by nationalism and religious bigotry? If you are yearning for a world that embraces unity and peace, consider supporting our channel by buying us a coffee. As this channel dares to question sensitive but problematic issues, some of our videos, especially the ones where we credit religions, may never get monetized. Your contribution empowers us to challenge prejudice, bridge gaps, and promote understanding. And now we need to address the true powerhouse behind much of the Islamist militancy we see across the Middle East and beyond, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC. When we look closely at the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, 
it becomes clear that their agenda goes far beyond Iran's national interests. Though based in Iran, the IRGC's mission is not about defending Iran itself. Rather, it's an expansionist force aiming to spread an Islamist ideology. Even its name, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, signals that their loyalty lies not with the Iranian nation, but with a larger mission to promote and defend the barbaric Islamic ideology worldwide. Iran's constitution enshrines this, assigning the IRGC the explicit role of exporting the Islamic revolution beyond Iran's borders. Since its establishment, the IRGC has used terrorism to influence regions across the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, and beyond by employing conmen and militias. The IRGC has actively supported militias and terror organizations like Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza, and the Houthis in Yemen. Their support includes providing military training advanced weaponry and funding to bolster these groups' agendas and destabilize nations. This aligns with the IRGC's ultimate mission, advancing Islamic movements and undermining the influence of the West and any secular and liberal governance in Muslim-majority regions. The IRGC's global ambitions have led to attempted assassinations, kidnappings, and attacks far beyond Iran's borders targeting dissidents, journalists, and even political figures on Western soil. Recently, for instance, they plotted attacks against U.S. officials, including targeting former President Donald Trump and Iranian journalists living in exile in the West. While some countries like the United States and Canada have designated the IRGC as a terrorist organization, the European Union has yet to follow suit. While some progress has been made, with countries like Germany closing down IRGC-linked mosques and Belgium exploring similar measures, a united and resolute response from the entire EU is still essential. So to all those protesting on campuses and streets, are you prepared to support an ideology that silences its critics and enforces archaic laws on its people? Before waving your flag, consider the fate of those who once stood in solidarity with Islamic movements, only to find themselves imprisoned or executed when the promises of freedom gave way to a reality of oppression. Even Ayatollah Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Republic. Mm. Excuse me, but why do we keep calling these individuals Ayatollah in the news? In Arabic, Ayatollah means sign of God. But honestly, do you see any divine signs in their actions or policies? So let's just call them Blight of Law from now on. So sorry, I was just saying. Blight of Law Khomeini openly acknowledged the broader stakes, stating, Emruz baraye hifse Islam. باید ما از همه چیزایی که در ذهنمون هست و کدورت هایی که فرض کنید یه وقتی داریم دست برداریم برای خدا با هم باشیم اگر اینطور شد شما حفظ خواهید شد و اسلام را خواهید صادر کرد به همه دنیا و من به شما عرض کنم که اگر خدای نخواسته خدای نخواسته اسلام در ایران سیلی بخورد بدانید که در همه دنیا سیلی خواهد خورد و بدانید که به این زودی که نمیتونه سرش رو برند کنند This declaration underscores why decisive actions against the Islamic Republic are essential to counter its global influence It's time for Western politicians to translate rhetoric into impactful measures declare the IRGC a terrorist organization as already done by countries like the US and Canada, and adopt comprehensive sanctions aimed at marginalizing the regime. History shows that Islamic regimes and movements like the Islamic Republic occupying Iran only respond to tangible pressure. For instance, Hezbollah's compliance with UN Resolution 1701, agreeing to withdraw beyond the Litany River came only after military intervention by Israel, 
This precedent demonstrates that only firm and unified pressure, rather than half measures or empty declarations, compels these regimes to retreat and reconsider their aggressive policies. Finally, English Rumi calls for citizens and activists worldwide to press their governments to prioritize human rights over economic interests. The Islamic Republic must face total isolation until it abandons its oppressive policies and ceases exporting Islamism globally. Let's act now to protect the values we hold dear and to stand in solidarity with the oppressed voices in Iran and beyond. To effectively counter the Islamic Republic's influence, English Rumi advocates for decisive and unified actions from democratic nations. Firstly, embassies linked to the Islamic Republic should be downgraded to consulates with a sole focus on serving Iranian citizens abroad, eliminating all political representation. This is vital as the regime's diplomatic presence often serves as a platform for spreading propaganda and undermining host countries' values. Expelling Iranian ambassadors would send a strong signal that the global community refuses to legitimize a regime whose policies directly contradict democratic principles and human rights. This is not a clash of civilizations. It's a clash between barbarism and civilization. All we know, Iran is funding the anti-Israel protests that are going on right now outside this building. Not that many, but they're there and throughout the city. Well, I have a message for these protesters. When the tyrants of Tehran, who hang gays from cranes and murder women for not covering their hair, are praising, promoting, and funding you, you have officially become Iran's useful idiots. That's amazing, absolutely amazing. Some of these protesters hold up signs proclaiming gays for Gaza. They might as well hold up signs saying chickens for KFC. Don't tune away just yet. We are ending this video with a beautiful anti-Islam poem from Attar, the renowned Persian Sufi poet. But before that, don't forget to like share and subscribe till later peace oh muslims i'm that heathen who this creed i scorn being called a muslim a non-muslim belt i've worn i locked the sufi lodge the tavern i embrace wine brings me pride and grace the mosque leaves me disgraced when goddess is in the pub, the Kaaba in vain, my fame as a pub crawler for her I sustain. <laughs>